Welcome to the Massage Hodge podcast. My name is Nick Baturka, a licensed massage therapist in Portland, Oregon. I am joined today by fellow massage therapist, Cal Cates in the state of Virginia, who joins me as part of my ongoing series to interview a fellow massage therapist in all 50 states. Cal is a massage therapist, of course, an educator, a writer, the executive director of Heal Well, which seeks to improve the experience of living with acute chronic and terminal illness, and they are also the co-host of their own podcast called Massage Therapy Without Borders. Cal Cates, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Ah, that's a that's a great intro. Yeah. You, got lot, you got a lot going on over there. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. busy over here, for sure. No doubt. So I like to start, before we talk about Virginia, to give me a little uh, comic book number one, if you will, an origin story as to how you came to massage therapy, and then in your case, maybe transition into how you started specializing in oncology and working with the terminally ill. Yeah. Uh, well, I have a very unexciting uh, story, at least for the first part, because I, I, to this day, I still don't know why I went to massage school. Um, I, I have a degree in liberal arts, uh, English, and um, I thought I would go to law school and I don't know, as I went through my undergrad, I was like, oh, maybe that's not what I want to do. And um, I I worked, I went to college in Iowa and I, I worked at a, a company that set up carnival tents and wedding tents and stuff like that for a couple of years after I graduated. And then I made my way to DC and long story short, I was working for a company and um, the woman who owned the company was stealing from uh, our program partners oh and went to jail. And um, so we all showed up for work one Friday and, and they said, um, so you don't have a job anymore and uh, welcome to your last day. Holy smokes. So I walked down the street and got a job as a bartender. And while I was working as a bartender, somehow I found my way to a massage school orientation. And uh, the first day of massage school, I was like, oh, this might be like the thing that I'm supposed wow. to do with my life. Uh, and the first massage I ever had when I applied to massage school, part of the application was you had to go get a massage oh, and write about it. Yeah. So I had never, like massage wasn't even a thing. Like no one I knew got massage. Yeah. It was like something that happened on TV. Um, <laughs> so yeah. So and, while the I depiction, was, and the depiction on TV is not always the best. Not yeah. a thing I wanted to do. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> definitely not. So, uh, but while I was in massage school, I found myself at the bedside of my grandfather who I didn't know was dying. I knew that he was sick, but um, he died while I was massaging him. Um, he just, uh, I was just working with his hand and I watched him take his last breath. And, um, I don't remember, it was not like a lightning bolt moment where I was like, Oh, this is what I'm going to do. But that seemed to be the point at which my focus shifted toward sort of, Oh, wait a minute. Like this, I want to do this with massage. This felt really, that felt really normal for me to be right there at that moment. And um, I don't think that is necessarily normal for a lot of people. So um, to feel like, wow, like what if I could make a living being with people who are in this place, whether it's near death or just dealing with serious illness. And so, yeah. you know, I found the leaders in, in that field and, and I worked with Gail McDonald and Tracy Walton and read Don Nelson's books and um, Irene Smith and just kind of, like, oh, like there's a different way to be with people than the way we're typically taught. I mean, I, I think I'm lucky that I went to a massage school that really was designed to support transformation, personal transformation, um, in addition to skills. But I think there's still sort of a bent in massage school that like you, you sort of look at the body like a thing that you're going to fix with your hands. And as I read the books written by these people who had been at the bedside of people who are dying of AIDS and Alzheimer's and dementia, I was like, oh, like, why do we reserve this for people who are dying? And I thought, you know, there's, there's something I want all massage therapists to, to have this perspective, at least, regardless of the type of work they do. And, mm. and working with people at the end of life really pushed me into my own really intensive, um, I guess, self-discovery um, journey. Yeah. And the more I did that, the more I felt like, oh, like this is really missing from, well, from humans' lives in general. But, you know, if we're showing up to people in pain, we better know ourselves pretty well. So, yeah. Well, thank you for that 
yeah. little, little roundup of your story. Yeah, certainly. So I, there's no, I don't have a clever way to transition into this, but we're, <laughs> no we're just going to jump over to your state. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I could add a tr an audio transition, a little tap totally. date or something. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just talk about Virginia really quick. What does it take to get a license in your state and to maintain a license there? So we have, I feel like, uh, one of the lower ends of requirements. We require 500 hours from a, a recognized school. Um, and it, um, I don't know if that, I don't think that school has to be in Virginia. Um, mm -hmm. We have, I think, I looked it up actually, we have about 15 schools that would be considered approved in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, I was actually trained out of school in the District of Columbia, and I was able to bring my transcript from that school uh -huh. to apply for my license in Virginia. Um, you have to pass the MBLEX, of course. Uh, I believe when you get your first license, it's $140, uh, and then we renew every two years um, on the anniversary of your own license. I know some states kind of have one day that everybody renews, um, but whenever your license was issued two years from that date, you renew, and it's, it's $95, I think, and you um, it's 24 CEs. And Virginia is one of the states that uh, I really appreciate that 12 of those hours have to be very massage specific, mm -hmm. but you can basically make an argument for all kinds of other training that is relevant to the practice of massage that isn't necessarily technique driven or- mm, uh, That is which, nice. Yeah, I think is, is a nice uh, variety. I don't know how many people take advantage of that, but, um, and of course, like as is true with a lot of states, if you're nationally board certified, you can just renew your license because I guess they assume that if you're board certified, you've already checked all of their boxes. So it ah. holds a board certification or, and then you have the list of other stuff. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know if you caught my part of the conversation when I interviewed Laura Allen, but I had, I had been asking people about their thoughts about like what we would look, like, how would a national standard look and her answer to that sort of felt like a mic drop. And I was just like, well, I'm not going to ask about that anymore. I don't know. <laughs> Do you think there's anything to that? I don't, I don't know if it's, if it's just well, too, too many hurdles to clear. Well, I think as a profession, we have a really hard time committing to holding, creating and holding a high standard. And having been somebody who, you know, for the last probably 10 years or so of my massage career, I've been heavily involved in various levels of, you know, policy and education. And the conversation always comes back to um, people aren't going to go for that. And I'm like, well, do you want to make everybody happy or do you want to hold a high standard? And we've never been able to sort of achieve consensus as an, as a, as a profession around that. And I think that, um, and I'll just say like we do on our, on our podcast, NCB has a really strong lobby. And I think that um, there is a real sense that they are the only game in town and that there's no sense considering something different. And, you know, I know that their party line is it's the highest voluntary credential in the land. And so, and they sort of say that like it's its own mic drop, but I feel like it's like saying that you set a high bar at a limbo contest for centipedes. Like <laughs> there's no, it's not hard to get board certified. Um, it's actually not much more, if it is more, than what you need to just be licensed in most states. And consumers don't know the difference between a board certified practitioner. So right. I'm gonna pay extra money every two years to have this certificate that doesn't mean anything. And the other line that I feel like they, they use is to say, well, we wanna be recognized as healthcare providers, so we need to use the same language. And so physicians, are board certified and consumers recognize that lingo. My organization, Heal Well, almost all of our work happens in hospitals. And initially when board certification was, was put out, we required all of our therapists to have it. We said, okay, this is new. It's not gonna work if you don't believe in it. And we required it for six years. And it just didn't get any stronger and become any mm. more meaningful. And so we actually went to the hospitals where we had included board certification as part of what they call your delineation of privileges. When you, when you reapply to be a right. part of the staff, you have to say, these are the things that we meet to be allowed to do these things. And we said, you know, we're, we're not able to hire the therapists we want because they're not willing to be board certified. Mm. And we can't actually, we're not going to walk away from these therapists because we can't stand behind this credential. And the physicians 
said, we envy you because our board certification doesn't mean anything either. Mm. It just means I paid $300. And yeah. so, you know, I feel like as a profession, we really have to decide where we stand. And, and I don't, there's a whole bunch of, it's a lightning rod discussion to talk about the two tiered system, but I don't know how we solve this issue. Because, I mean, I think part of why we're struggling with COVID so much is because massage therapists don't have a grounding in basic science. And here we are, not not knowing how to critically read research or to read articles about disease. And um, this is because our training is is rub this muscle and this will happen. And I think that we're going to continue to struggle until we're willing to hold people to a higher standard. All right. Well, so. So there was more to say. No, I'm glad I asked you that. That was good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So May 2020, we're still in the midst of this. Yes. Tell me what, tell me how it unfolded in Virginia and where you're at now. Yeah. So um, we, our governor is actually a physician. Uh, he's a pediatrician. And, um, you know, I think, I think when this started, uh, he did a really good job of of being one of the first to come out with a stay at home order, and our stay at home order extends until June tenth, um, which is interesting because he just had a press conference announcing sort of the phase one reopening, and so we've shifted from stay at home to safer at home, which okay. feels a little bit equivocating, but okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that um, we we've really. Um, I wrote a blog last week about how we don't really know what's happening because there's not any real guidance from is, our- Is this your hot potato post? The hot potato post. I would encourage anyone who hears this to read that in its entirety. It is disappointing, but also enlightening. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. The basic premise is that no one wants to be left holding this hot potato of like where we stand as an industry. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, we- we struggle like so. States are opening, and uh, one of our one of our educators uh, on the Healwell team works at, and practices in Kentucky. And so this morning, Kentucky said May twenty fifth massage will resume. And so she sent us the guidelines for Kentucky, and they're some of the best guidelines I've seen so far. But what's so preposterous about all of these guidelines is do everything you can from six feet away. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck. And and in the Kentucky guidelines, it actually says um, that do as much of the massage as you can, as much of what would happen in the session from six feet away. So, you know, and I mean, so we should just laugh about that because it's yeah. funny. I have pretty long arms. R- pretty long arms, right. <laughs> but then I was like, okay, so what does this mean? Does this mean that like, so you tell me what's happening with you. I put my hands on you for three, four minutes. And I sort of show you what I would do if I was going to be working here for the next 15 minutes. And then you massage yourself or like, do you come in with your spouse or your roommate or like a, a massage buddy? And I sort of teach them like, it's not safe. That's why these guidelines are so dumb because we yeah. can't social distance and do massage. So in Virginia, we are lumped in with personal care services Mm -hmm. um, as so many other states are. And so at two o'clock today, our governor had a press conference where he announced a lot of stuff, but it's not clear if massage is going back right now Um, Mm -hmm. because he never said massage exactly. So like um, places that do pedicures and manicures and barbershops we think are opening, um, but we're supposed to check our government website later today and there will be more clarity supposedly but you know if he said that we're phase one that means everybody collecting unemployment stops collecting unemployment on may 15th right so that's pretty soon (laughs) um (laughs) i'd like to know now and we have 14 therapists who work for us and we had to lay off 10 of our people um we just basically have our administrative staff still on our payroll right now Mm -hmm. and we want to be able to tell our therapist something, but there's really no guidance and there's no, you know, the Virginia board. I mean, you know, from the potato post, like they're like, yep, yeah, not really our job to tell you how to do this safely. So I think we're going to be stealing from other states whose, whose health departments have said, this is what practice looks like. Yeah. So what have you been doing? I know you've been, been busy creating content and creating educational resources. Yeah. Uh, some of which I have uh, used myself. We'll talk more about that. But 
So, so what else, what, what, what's been occupying your time? Yeah, well, certainly applying for um, disaster relief loans. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, it sounds like if you haven't applied for them, that sounds like, well, how much time could that take? A crazy amount of time that I will <laughs> never get back <laughs> is how long it takes. Um, yeah. And luckily, we are, we're based in Arlington, Virginia, and Arlington has a very robust business community. So we applied for another grant today that's specific to Arlington. Um, so, you know, putting together the right financial paperwork to do all that stuff as an organization, we really, um, we really try to treat our team like a family. And so mm-hmm. our, our, um, we have four, what we call clinical leads who are therapists who are sort of in charge of two or three of our clinical sites. And so they have been coordinating weekly what they're calling therapist support groups. So they have a zoom call once a week with our therapist team and everybody just kind of, you kind of get on and go like, so is everybody put pants on today? Everybody <laughs> eat? I mean, you know, like we check in about unemployment and, and other stuff like that, but really just like, we're still here and yeah. we'll be here until we can do what we do together again. Um, yeah. yeah. Creating, creating blogs and messages to help people decode things that are happening. And then, you know, we've been wanting to, to create online education offerings for years, but you know, you never have time. So, um, <laughs> the you one of the people, away, yeah. exactly. So one of the people we kept on is our education coordinator and we've just been transitioning our, as much as we can of our live courses to, uh, online. And, you know, some of our classes, I mean, we teach oncology massage. So some of that you can't, you can't learn that online, but we have a six day class that typically comes up in June. So we're doing as much of that as we can online as kind of a prereq so that when we can all physically be together again, people can say, I took your three days or whatever on online and I'm ready now for the hands-on component of this course. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's been, you know, we're, we're just juggling and we're, because we work mostly in hospitals, our timeline is all kinds of messed up because yeah. hospitals aren't ready for us yet. So, you know, the governor can say whatever the governor wants, but that doesn't mean we can actually go back to work. Right. Yeah. Interesting. So I've been asking people on here how they feel like this whole collective traumatic experiences changes our industry. Mm. I'm going to ask it to you in a more specific way. Yeah. If you, I mean, and you can answer this based on like what you hope to see. Mm-hmm. How does massage therapy look different in 2023 compared to how it looked in 2019? I wanted to give you further enough into the future to to compare it to like wh- how is this the, the longer arc of this experience has changed our field? Or if you maybe take a more dim view and say eventually we'll all forget or I, however you want to take that. Yeah. Well, I do. I mean, I, I yes. Uh, in both of those ways, because I think that um, humans have a really short memory. And I think as soon as things feel normal enough, most of us won't retain the sort of lessons that we've learned in this time. And, and so I will admit that there's a part of me that sees the value in our extended discombobulation, because the longer things are in a state of unrest, the harder we have to look at like, what's necessary? What exists that's extra? How do we really move out of this into a place of more clarity. And, you know, I was talking with a colleague uh, about just, we've had an amazing response to our back to practice video and to the potato post Mm -hmm. and like from all over the world and just sort of like saying, wow, like, you know, I woke up yesterday and I was like, man, I'm just, I feel like I'm having like a COVID hangover because it's been so much intense emotion and consideration of serious ethical issues and we're hearing tons of stories from therapists all over who are struggling under what I would say is an umbrella of the same issues, but certainly feeling our own individual angst. And, and she suggested, and I think that this metaphor really fits that this is just a, it's a prairie fire. It Mm -hmm. is a really needed, not so controlled burn. Um, And that, you know, uh, it makes me sad that people who are close to retirement are just thinking, I'm just going to retire now. You know, that, could have worked two, three, five more years, but just feel like it's too heavy a lift. You know, I don't want to do it. And, um, and I think that, um, the massage therapy profession is going to take a hit, uh, in the public realm because therapists are going to go back too soon and spas and franchises, unfortunately, despite their best efforts, I think are going to be infection hotspots. Um, and, I think the public is kind of go going to go like, you know, we should have known better. 
Um, I hope I'm wrong and I will buy a hat for every single person and I will eat that hat if I'm wrong. <laughs> I hope that massage opens up and nobody, we don't see a spike in infections and everything's great. But yeah. even in the states that have already opened, I've seen on social media and we've received emails from therapists who said, I did everything right. I followed the guidelines. And two days after I opened, a client called me and said they tested positive. And so now I'm self-quarantining and I'm closed. And, uh, you know, I mean, that is going to happen. Yep. I don't know that we can wait until there's no risk, but testing could be a lot better. Contact tracing could be a lot better. And mm -hmm. I think that the, the intake questions we're asking and these steps of taking people's temperatures and stuff, I think it's creating a false sense of safety. And um, I think we don't really understand what we could understand yet about this disease in order to truly make ourselves safe. Yeah, interesting. You mentioned your back to practice educational video. Yeah. And I and that's where you go over the guidelines of what it might look like to con to transform one's home office. Is yeah. that that's the right title for that one, uh -huh. right? Yeah. Yep. So I watched that uh -huh. and it was great. <laughs> but it filled me with so much despair that day. Yeah. I was just yeah. like I was like now what? I was I like and it and everyone listening, you should watch it. I think it's a great conversation starter. It's like to just really put your mindset into how you're gonna think about reopening. Yeah. It's very thorough. Yeah, we it's really it's funny that you say that about despair because what happened was we were um we were sitting here uh having some coffee. And it was like the day or two after the back to practice guidelines came out, maybe MP. And we were just talking about like, oh, you know, what, what is this going to look like? And so I, of course, have been thinking about, I'm missing, I don't have a lot of private clients anymore, but I am missing them and want to see them. And I was like, okay, so what would it look like? And as we started to talk to through it, we were like, oh, we should do like a little, like a tutorial. Mm -hmm. And Thursday night, we were done making our little tutorial. Um, yeah. you know, like we were just like, Oh my God. And what about this? And what about this? And, yeah. you know, we decided not to try to procure any legit equipment because we really feel like that's where people are going to be starting from. And, mm -hmm. and that you don't, there are some things that you don't have to go spend a lot of money on, but so many people wrote to us and said, I never would have thought about a button down or like an apron. Yeah, I would have just pulled my shirt off over my head. And, you know, people have said, well, how, why all the gloves? Or, you know, people have sent us questions, which is, you know, we put the disclaimer at the end. We just winged it. We've been working in hospitals for years. So we know a little bit about PPE and, you know, uh, disinfection. But um, we, we just really wanted people to, we didn't want to overwhelm people, but we wanted to have people kind of do what you did and go, Oh, like this is going to be different. Yeah. And, you know, and the states are very different in what they're recommending. Um, some are saying PPE, maybe, maybe not. Um, Kentucky, like I said, they, they said the client should have a mask at all times. The therapist should have a mask at all times, as well as goggles and a sleeved gown. And therapists keep writing to us and going, wait, so I can't use my forearms? I'm like, maybe not. Yeah, that was, you yeah, know, that was one of my takeaways. I was like, oh, yeah, way. So, fundamentally, yeah. Yeah, so I think it is going to. I haven't change. heard anyone talk about Ashiatsu therapists. Do they make? Oh my gosh! Well, and it's interesting. Therapy? Yeah. Yeah, one of my friends is an Ashiatsu therapist, and she sent me a little video of how she set up her room, and she's like, "Is this, is this even close to like, you know, clean?" And I was like, "It looks like you're doing the absolute best you can." And this is the thing that you know we just really want people to think about. Even if you do everything you can, you can still transmit and contract COVID. Yeah. Um, kind of what's your risk threshold and that it's not even just you and your client. You know, you go home to the people that live at your house and it just transmits pretty easily. So. Yeah. So another piece of this whole scenario that I'm really concerned about is the divisions that it can oh. create am amongst us. Yeah. And I'm not too involved in some of the the groups like on Facebook, I hear, I hear tell how things get really heated and sort of nasty. And I'm like, yeah, Why? like what yeah. are we doing here? Right. <laughs> like, right. It just shocks me when I hear about that, when I hear about yeah. like, that sort of rhetoric that goes on. Yeah. But I, I just worry about like a practitioner 
and you have like a relationship with your colleagues in your community and then they find out that you're that you've gone back to work and you haven't like taken the same level of measures that they have and then yeah they don't want to refer to you or be involved with you anymore like that all that like really ugly divisive thing like, yeah I, yes i don't even know what to call it it just doesn't feel good yeah inside and i'm just worried about it yeah i'm i mean when when you ask the question about sort of the future of the profession uh i i really worry and it's funny i i really enjoy um, the Civil War. That's not funny because the Civil War is not funny, but <laughs> it's interesting that I'm reading a book right now about the Civil War and and just about the the parallels, really, and sort of the way that people sort of dig in. And, and I think that, um, you know, uh, yeah, I think that we are in trouble. Uh, and I think that people um, behave on social media in ways that they wouldn't behave in person. Yeah. And um, I think that, you know, the dirty secret about caregivers, if I can call us that broadly, mm -hmm. is that caregiving is, is about control. If you haven't examined your own stuff and you get a whole bunch of control freaks who are loving in a room together and no one is being as caring as they are. Mm. And, and they're going to punch you in the face until you care the way they care. <laughs> and, it, you know, it's funny, but that's what you see is yeah. it does come from a place of, how can you put people in danger or, you know, why aren't you doing it in this way that I've decided is safe and appropriate? And, and, um, we're just bad at letting each other be adults. And so we get in there and we duke it out and, and I don't duke it out. I just, I get tagged all the time because I think people want me to come in and be like, break it up. And I'm like, Oh, and it's already 90 comments long. And I'm like, I could die tomorrow. I don't have time yeah. to get into this fist fight. Yeah. So, well, yeah. I guess that's just going to have to unfold and some of us will have to take extra care of each other, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Well, and I, and I think that it, um, I mean, it was happening before COVID. It was happening about how Ashiatsu is better than myofascial and. Oh yeah. Know, right. So we just have a new thing to direct our anger toward, but yeah. Been, I mean, I, I kind of want to let our clients peek into our private groups because we're supposed to be healers, right? Like we're supposed to- Yeah, they to would be shocked. Yeah. Loving Zen people and we're like yeah. all caps and it's like, oh, <laughs> what's happening? <laughs> yeah. Well, while, while I still have you here, if yeah. I do still, I still have some time, sure. would, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about, just for, for other therapists who maybe don't have an experience with oncology massage, mm -hmm. like- why and I so I don't what would you say to me like why why I might look at that or maybe what you get out of it personally not that it's about you as a person but yeah just talk about that that part of your career and yeah more about it well I mean I will say that for me um I, I still don't I mean it turns out years later I discovered that my grandpa did actually have cancer but when I went to see him I didn't know that that's what he was sick with and um I, I honestly feel like I was sort of led to oncology massage because I had um, I had some, uh, some stuff to work out for myself. And that, and part of that was that I was sort of asleep in my life and that, um, I was lucky to find the type of training and the type of mentors who kind of said like, these are only 10% important, no matter who you're touching really. Um, but particularly when you're working with people who are, have been told they have cancer. So they may not be at the end of their lives. They may have a very treatable cancer, but when you're told you have cancer, it shifts something inside you. And some people go into a ball, some people read everything they possibly can, some people change their lives and get divorced and you know say, oh my God, like I could die tomorrow. Um, and I feel like working with people, not just cancer, but with advanced illness, um, really makes it hard to phone in your life. Mm -hmm. And that when you work every day with people who thought they had more time and don't, who are your age or younger, or, you know, you draw these parallels and you go, oh, wow, like, it's really just a twist of fate that means that I'm this, quote, healthy person providing a service to this person who has an illness. And that tomorrow I could get this news. This afternoon, I could have a stroke and need some kind of rehabilitation. And I think that that is really something that I feel like would benefit all massage therapists, that when people come to see you for massage, even if they're not sick or living with disease, 
they're coming to you because their bodies aren't doing what they want them to do for the most part. I mean, some people come for self-care because they don't want their bodies to start doing things that they don't want. Mm -hmm. But on some level, people have, they're having aches and pains and limited function and they want you to make that stop. And I feel like we have to be really so much better as a profession at understanding the tenderness in that request when people come to us. And I feel like that's one of the things that oncology massage has really taught me is how to just show up to people, even the person who has knee pain after a marathon, or even the person who has piriformis syndrome because they never get up from their desk that like, this is about how do I make your body a place that you enjoy again? And knowing in myself, the experience of what happens when my body is not a place I'm enjoying mm. and, and just showing up as a human to another human and letting go of any story that I know how to fix your body or, yeah. Where do you think some of the apprehension comes from? Is it is it scary for just the average practitioner without experience to, they think like cancer, like, oh, that's that has too many contraindications. I don't know what to do. I should, they should go see someone else. I don't, you know. So I guess a way to answer that is, what do you learn in the more advanced training around it? Yeah. And how can someone, is there something I would, would know someone coming through my door who, who during the intake tells me they have cancer? Yeah. And I don't, yeah. I don't curl up and go, you can't have a massage. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, and there are places that because we live in a litigious society, if you work in a spa or a clinic, often they'll have a policy that if a person reveals in their intake that they have cancer, you turn them away. Yeah. Because you want to risk it, which I, I, you know, I mean, we could have a whole nother episode about yeah. that, but I think that, I'm really glad you phrased it the way you did because the thing that we really start with in our courses is that oncology massage is not about contraindications. And I think I can sort of liken it to prenatal massage in this way that mm. I could probably massage you if you're pregnant and not hurt you or injure your baby, but you're not gonna get the best massage you could get. And so someone comes into your office with cancer, you could work lightly, whatever that means. And we have a whole chapter about that in our class because that's a super subjective way to describe right. pressure. Um, and if you're not used to working at that pressure, it's gonna feel like a crappy, tentative, scared massage, which is not a good massage. Yeah, and right? lightly for who? Like that's different. Right. Exactly, like if you're a rolfer and you tell me lightly and you're you know, an EFT therapist and you tell me lightly, these are very different types of yeah. light, right? So, and the other piece is that, so, so where we come from is, when a person who tells you that they have cancer or even a history of cancer treatment, which is, I think that's one of the misunderstood things about oncology massages. We're not just talking about people who are in the midst of chemo. If you had a mastectomy 20 years ago, chances are good. You should probably have an oncology massage because there are lifelong complications related to that surgery and probably the related treatment mm -hmm. that a skilled therapist is just going to give you a more client centered massage that will be more supportive of your body. Hmm. So, um, I mean, on a basic level, I guess it's, a, it's, it's as much about customer service as it is about safety. Oh. Um, and just really being able to ask the right questions so you can provide the best massage for this person. Hmm. That's great. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for, for talking about your, your history with massage therapy and Heal Well and the, the crisis and Virginia. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, it's uh, we got a long way to go, but we'll get yeah, there. No doubt. Yes. One day at a time. I would encourage everyone to go check out your blog. A lot of great resources there. Thank you. Heal Well has like some some free educational resources mm -hmm. and some paid courses, yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. So all sorts of things to find over there. And then the okay. podcast Massage Therapy Without Borders you're you're continuing to record. Yep. And I am going to continue to listen and to um, learn many things myself. Excellent. So we can chat for a few minutes after this recording, but thanks to all the listeners. And thanks for having me. Thanks so much. Bye.